we're going to be recording. Um, because and norm, we always record and we always share the recording um, after the session. But today, in particular, knowing that so many of our colleagues may not be with us, um, we are going to um, really promote out the recording of today. Um, so with that said, I really am going to turn it over to Robin to introduce us to our speaker today. Um, and Robin, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Robin Khan. I, as Marian said, um, recently joined the Matro team at Hebrew College. Um, and my work is focusing on professional development for synagogue educators. Um, Susan and I first started exchanging emails probably a year ago. Um, and when we decided that we were going to um, focus on stories, I said, oh, I have to reach out to Susan. And um, so it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Susan to you. She is an award-winning children's book author. Her most recent book is A Sky Full of Song. And today she's going to um, share with us the inspiration and research behind that book. Um, she's also written two other middle school historical novels, Black Radishes, which won a Sydney Taylor Honor Award, and Skating with the Statue of Liberty. She's also written a few picture books and has won the Jane Addams Peace Association Award, the New York State Charlotte Award, and her novels have been chosen for the Junior Library Guild and PJ Library Selections. And uh, a few of her books have even been translated into German and Chinese. And um, she is local to Boston. She's a professor of English and creative writing at Wellesley College. And I'm gonna drop the Amazon link to her website um, in the chat um, where all of her books are listed. And Susan, if at some point you want to put your own contact information in the, I guess I can put it in the chat while you're going, but I'll turn it over to you and welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. It's a great honor and pleasure to speak to you today. Um, yes. I mean, as Marion was saying, I too have been thinking about uh, stories and how they matter and how much they make um, the experience of other people vivid to us and how much it matters whose stories are told and what stories are left out and how much it matters to fill out the historical record by telling stories that haven't made it into um, the historical record. Um, and I, I think it especially matters for children. You know, I was thinking about how my sense of the world was shaped as a child by the books I read. For some reason, I mean, I was a book reading kind of a child, but for some reason, I really felt as if the books were representing real life or life the way it was supposed to be, even in really minor ways. Like I remember I, I grew up in Maryland where it hardly ever snowed and we would get like a tiny dusting of snow if we were lucky, it would be so exciting. But I read books where winter meant like huge drifts of snow and, um, you know, snow on trees and snowmen and snowballs and snow forts. And that seemed to me like real weather, the kind of weather that there should be. I mean, that seems silly, but that's really, you know, that's really how um, books sort of shaped my sense of the world. And I think they can shape our world view in more you know, powerful and, and potentially more insidious ways or more constructive ways as well. Um, so one of the sets of books that I read growing up was the Little House books, Little House, uh, you know, here's the Little House on the Prairie. And, um, you know, now, you know, very much a um, lot of questioning about her representation of Native Americans in particular, but, you um, some some people people continue to read these books and they they powerfully shape the way people view the world. Um, so I you know I read those as a child and I read also as an adult Willa Cather's um, My Antonia at some point later, and I realized how much they shaped my sense of who the um, who had settled the American West. That without my even really thinking about it. I thought of those settlers as white Native 
American born, I mean, bo born in America. Um, they were actually called Native Americans at the time, but that's confusing. Um, people born in America, white people born in America, and Christians, um, both uh, Willa, you know, Willa Cather's novel and the Little House books include representations of Christmas. So without my even really thinking about it, um, I thought of that as the population that settled the West, right? And it becomes in American history a kind of foundational myth of the, you know, the the American settlers, the settlers of America. Again, it can very much be questioned now in terms of the interactions with Native Americans, but that's, you know, a somewhat later development in our in our cultural mentality. Uh, so I realized I had kind of internalized this myth when the following thing happened to me. So I'm um, you, you, to understand the story, you need to know that I'm of a mixed um, racial and ethnic background, and not all of my ancestors are Jewish. So one of my brothers was researching our family history. He's very into that and um, posting things on Ancestry.com. And he sent us all out this photograph, which I'm about to show you if I can figure out how to share the screen. How do I do that? I never remember. Share screen. Yeah. Okay. This um, photograph, and we were all astonished by it because um, Stephen said that's our grandfather, the baby in the little baby carriage. It's a, in Oklahoma, and nobody in our family, nobody knew that he'd been born in a dugout in Oklahoma. So apparently, that's my great grandfather on that in that branch and that's my great grandmother but I didn't know that and, and that's an aunt of some kind and I, I found I looked at this photo I found it very touching I love how they've planted the um irises in front of the dugout there and that they've you know mustered the dog and the cat and gotten them to join the family for the photograph um you know it's it's touching and interesting and so I posted it on Facebook as one does right um and uh, my friends were astonished. You know how you get like the astonishment, you know, reaction on Facebook. And I partly thought, oh, people are paying attention. But I also thought, huh, why is everybody so astonished? And um, I, so I, I, I sort of began to wonder questions like, well, do, obviously, a substantial portion of the American population must descend from um, people who homesteaded. Um, so I got curious and figured it out. And it's about 30% or 25% of the American population is descended from people who homesteaded. So that, you know, that couldn't be the reason if we, you know, we think logically we'll know that, you know, people are descended from homesteaders, even if they don't know it. Um, and then I realized it's actually because I identify as Jewish and people were thinking Jews on living in, you know, um, sod houses, Jews living in dugouts. How could that, how could that be? Could that ever have been? And so people were astonished by this photograph, I think more than, than they would have been um, for somebody else who didn't identify as Jewish. Um, well, that got me curious about, whoops, I meant to continue sharing. Um, that got me curious about whether Jews ever did homestead and I began to research that question and I got very interested in it because I found out that yes, in fact, uh, Jews did homestead um, and that Jews came to this country, uh, the ones who homesteaded most, as, as we know, most Jewish immigrants to this country came to the cities and lived in New York, Chicago, Boston uh, and stayed in the cities. But some of them were really drawn by the promise of free land and by the idea of, of owning land and having um, a farming life. And a small percentage of Jewish immigrants to this country came relatively late um, in the homesteading period. Mostly they came in the 1890s and the early decades of the 20th century. And they got some of the least desirable land and that was in North and South Dakota. 
um, it was least desirable because it wasn't particularly easy to farm. It wasn't, it was dry. Um, it was difficult land to farm, it was cold in the winter. So here's a, here's an example of um, a Jewish family homesteading on the prairie. There oh. we have a family from 1905. Um, this is a more prosperous family than the one in the previous photograph. Um, and, you know, they got two horses and they've got actually a house that's above ground. But this is a Jewish family from Romania. Um, their names are, I wrote this down, Samuel, uh, Samuel and Hannah Schwartz and their daughter and their son-in-law in front of their, their house. Um, so... Yes, there were Jewish settlers on the prairie, and it's a little known. So once I, I found out about that, I thought, oh, and they've got their dog posing in the front, too. I just noticed their dog is, is situated there in the front. That's very charming. Um, so I, I got fascinated with this idea of, of what that experience would have been like. And I read a lot of history and I especially read a lot of memoirs and listened to oral histories and read transcribed oral histories because those are the best for writing historical fiction because they give you the experiences of daily life. And um, I began to formulate in my mind this story of 11 year old Shoshana Rozumny whose family come from uh, the Ukraine area of the Russian Empire and come and begin homesteading in North Dakota. And that's how, that's how this novel came about. Um, Jews, of course, had particular issues living a homesteading kind of life. Um, in addition to the normal difficulties and the difficulties of getting some of the least desirable land, they encountered um, anti-Semitism from the people around them, sometimes violent anti-Semitism, uh, sometimes less, you know, violent or just, you know, relatively benign. Um, and they had cultural problems in particular, how would you get fo kosher food out there on the prairie unless you had um, someone who could prepare the food and the meat in a kosher way. Um, they had more restrictions on the kind of food they could eat run the, than the typical settlers. And, and by the way, only about 25% of homesteaders ever succeeded in proving up their land and stayed farming that land because it was such a difficult thing to do um, because the conditions were so adverse and it was just really so hard to keep people alive under those circumstances. So when you add in the difficulties of the food being um, even more difficult, um, that meant probably even a smaller number of Jews remained farming the land. Uh, but also Jewish families wanted to get a Jewish education for their kids, which required being in a population of Jews, and they wanted their kids to find marriage partners in the next generation, and the kids would grow up quickly, and so they would quickly want to um, be in a larger, more urban environment where they had a larger population of Jews. So not too many stayed um, in their in their homesteading life. But I got really interested in finding out about their experiences and and wrote this novel about um, eleven year old Shoshana. Um, um, I will read you a little snippet of it, and I'll have to show it to you next to that little house on the prairie, because I'm like, this is a book we all know, and then this is uh, my little Jewish girl on the prairie, and if you look very closely, you can see that there's a menorah in the window of the dugout. Oh. Um, so I love that cover. I, I felt very lucky in the, the illustrator of the cover. So just to give you a sense of the situation of the story, I'm just going to read you a tiny snippet, but this is when the family is coming to North Dakota. The father and oldest brother have gone on first, as often happened. Um, the brother Anshul and the father have gone and, and begun the farming of the land in North Dakota and left behind for three years the mother and four daughters who are Libka, the oldest sister, Shoshana, the second, who's 11, and then Libka's 14, Shoshana's 11, and then their three-year-old uh, twin baby sisters. And 
Shoshana has had to leave behind her cat and is very angry with her mother because she had to leave behind her cat. And she thought, why couldn't they bring their cat? They were bringing the most important stuff. What was this about bringing the samovar and not bringing the cat? She thinks that was terrible. So she's kind of angry with her mother. So on the journey, um, there, there are a couple chapters before this bit I'm going to read to you, but on the journey, when Shoshana is in the New York train station, um, she finds a, um, a stray kitten and brings it along hidden in a bundle of pillows on the train trip to North Dakota. And here they are on the train on the last day. Um, okay. My stomach got jittery on the last day as the conductor called stops in North Dakota. If I hadn't had Zissel with me, desperately needing her freedom, I would almost have wanted to go on riding the train forever, to have stayed in this strange world that wasn't any place, just the space in between. We're getting close now, Mama said. Tidy yourselves in the washroom, especially you, Shoshana. I don't know how you managed to get so messy. We want to look nice for Papa. Lipka and I washed the baby's faces and hands and sent them back to Mama. Lipka turned her back and I retied the blue hair ribbon she always wore, adjusting the ends on which she had embroidered tiny white flowers, making sure that they hung evenly against her honey colored hair. Then Lipka helped me dab at the worst smudges on my dress and work a comb through my grimy snarled curls. Is this a little right, she asked. Yes, she needs to get out though. Maybe mama won't care that I brought her once we're there. Maybe I can pretend that I found her in North Dakota. My voice trembled a little. Would mama be really mad at me? Would papa? Do you remember papa and Ancho? I asked Lipka, suddenly feeling panicked. The train lurched and the comb caught on a snarl. Ow! Stand still, of course I do. But Lipka sounded less sure than her words. I am standing still. It's the train that's jostling. Remind me of something about them, quick. Lipka gently teased a snarl at the bottom of a lock of my hair. Well, of, of course you remember Papa, so big and laughing, playing with us, lifting you up on his shoulders and galloping around outside. And you remember that game we used to play with Ancho, the Rabbi Hillel game? I smiled. Yes, that I remembered. Ancho had invented the game. It came from the story about Rabbi Hillel being taunted by a fool. Tell me what is in the Torah while standing on one foot. I picked up one foot and wobbled so much I bumped into the walls of the washroom. Don't try it on a moving train, Shoshana. Livka moaned or I'll end up accidentally ripping all your hair out. Rabbi Hillel stood on one foot and told the fool, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That was the core of Jewish belief. Papa had told us many times. So Ancha and Libka and I competed to see who could say those words the most times in a row while standing on one foot. We got really fast at rattling out, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man, over and over again. You got up to 21 once, I said. You are the champion, not <laughs> 20, 23. And I could have done a lot more. Ancha was so mad because he'd only done 19. So he pushed me over. There, your hair is good enough. You'll remember everything when we see them again, I promise. Pearlie leaned her weight across my leg when I slid back into the seat. Papa is nice. Of course he's nice, I assured her. He's our father. Even Mama kept nervously smoothing her skirt and adjusting the flowered apron on her head. There's been an incident earlier about that. It still looked awkward and bunchy to me, like an apron, not a stern tickle. Why did Mama have to tie a cloth over her head anyway? Here in America, most ladies didn't seem to. Instead, Mama could arrange range her hair carefully so the scarred spot wouldn't show and wear an American hat. If Mama hadn't been wearing a stern tickle on the ship, those boys wouldn't have bothered us. The train screeched and hissed to a stop. Shacked in, called the conductor. We clambered out of the train and looked about, bewildered. The day was ending. A few dark buildings rose nearby. 
but beyond them the prairie spread out as vast and undulating as the sea. I heard a shout. A big man and a tall, lanky boy ran along the platform toward us. Family, my family, Papa's voice broke. He caught us all up into a huge hug. At last, you're here. So that's the little bit that I just wanted to read to you. Um, I, I could stop and take a few questions here and then move on to the, um, the second part of the presentation if anybody has um, a burning question. Or not burning question. <laughs> Janice, are you raising your hand or just moving your? <laughs> so, uh, Susan, I'm curious. Um, so, first of all, fascinating about your own family history in the first photograph that you yeah. showed us. Um, clearly, you're you you're weaving in the, um, you know, the oral history, the personal story of these families, but then pulling in from traditional Jewish texts. That so, can you say a little bit about? you know, that dynamic of the, of weaving those two things together? Yeah, well, once I have, you know, my way of writing historical fiction is basically to try to get the historical situation, you know, pretty much understood in my head, but it inevitably happens that as I read, I mean, as I write, I run into more questions. So, I, I might be writing, uh, you know, and then thinking, you know, wait a minute, what were they brushing their hair with? Did they have hairbrushes? So then I have to like go back and do some research on that. Mm. Kind of or I made some reference to the baby's diapers. And one of my, my writing partner who is from India said, I don't think poor people would have had put their babies in diapers. I think, you know, in India, when really poor people just like hold their baby out when they can sense their baby needs to be. So I had to do some research and that was mm. a hard on whether you know, uh, poor Jewish people in Ukraine would have worn put diapers on their babies mm. in 1900. You know that was a tough question, but I did finally find a, man, a mention of it, so I concluded that yes, they did. So you know, I get try to get the history more or less under control, and then I you know sort of let my imagination go, and I see where you know where where it runs to, and it I end up you know putting at weaving in, you know, as you said, like just memories of mine that come up or, or things I've read, um, just stories that seem, you know, perfect for this situation. Cause I have the father be the one who, who talks to the children uh, about Jewish matters mostly and uh, on rare, uh, on rare occasions. So they have these memories of him talking about those things, but, but that um, episode also weaves in a, a memory of mine from childhood, which is completely sort of transplanted here, but I have a, a scar. On my elbow. I don't know if you can still see it that the brother, the same brother who posted the photograph on Facebook. No, it wasn't him. It was my other, one of my other brothers. I have five brothers and sisters. So one of my brothers, I, we were doing like a pogo stick jumping competition and seeing who could jump the most times on the pogo stick. And I was beating my brother and he was angry. And so he pushed me over backwards on the sidewalk from a pole at pogo stick. And I get this really bad gash in my elbow. I still have a scar there. So, you know, that memory kind of came up when I was thinking, what could she remember about her brother? Uh, that would be kind of charming, but also realistic for, you know, kids. And, and that memory came up and then I kind of ended up sort of transplanting on it to the story of Rabbi Hillel because that just came into my head and it seemed like a, an appropriate story so um, that they might be remembering. So that's kind of how it, fiction is kind of like for me, it's like this patchwork quilt kind of thing of all these different, um, all these different pieces. Um, and today I was going to actually, um, somebody said, oh, you're doing a writing workshop. And I thought, well, maybe I should do a writing workshop. Sure, because I'm going to talk about, you know, partly one of what things I wanted to talk about today was how can you get children um, understanding how you can understand your own family's history through stories. And a, a lot of some of my books like have have really come from family stories. So that that is Black Radishes. That was my first novel. And that is the story of a Jewish boy in Nazi-occupied France. And that comes pretty closely 
from my father's own experiences, not entirely. And then not, but I mean, not entirely at all in, in complicated ways, but the, the basic trajectory the family takes as they are leaving France is my father's family's trajectory. But I felt actually that I shouldn't tell his story directly because I felt like that was his story to tell. And I didn't want to kind of usurp it by by telling it myself. So I changed a lot. But then this is um, Skating with the Statue of Liberty is my second novel. And that is um, inspired by his experiences when he came to America, but more indirectly. So in 1942, and the family moved to the Upper West Side and um, he went to junior high school there. And yeah, anyway, so um, a lot of my stories do come fairly um, do do sort of have their roots in in family stories or my own memories um yeah sandra yeah hi thank you so much for this um i am also a author and um i'm working on a middle grade historical novel i was just wondering if you have um historical readers or at what point do you sort of maybe ask someone else who might know even more about that period to look at it and um secondly I was just curious uh the photo you showed of the uh Jewish settlers in Oklahoma if you knew where in Oklahoma that was I have Jewish settler relatives um from mm -hmm. Oklahoma as well so I was just curious um well, that is actually the non-Jewish part of my family in or in Oklahoma, and I don't know what um, I'm going to say city, but it's not a city. You know, I don't know what region of Oklahoma it was. Um, I have to see if my brother knows, but I'm curious. I'd love to hear more about your family. I hope that's what you're writing about. Um, but um, I I have an academic background, and I am so lucky to have access to an academic library. So I feel as if mm -hmm. I um, have got. Um, a lot of access to scholarly history. It makes life so much easier. And I've done, you know, I, I, I've i gotten a few sources for other friends sometimes because I can get any book in the world on, you know, anything basically brought uh, through interlibrary loan brought to the academic library. So that's very helpful. But still, I run into these questions like the diaper one, which nobody knows the answer to. So like, of course, that's not going to be in a book of, of academic history about, um, you know, about anything, mm -hmm. you know, nobody, unless somebody's written a book on the conditions of women's lives in y Ukraine in, you know, <laughs> the late 19th, early 20th century, there's not going to be a mention of diapers. But I thought, well, maybe some of my scholarly friends know this thing, these things. So sometimes I have these questions and then I think, okay, who do I know? Who knows about that area? And then I send them an email and then they sometimes say, I don't know, but my friends such and such might know. And then I email their friends and nobody do. I mean, I, you know, I, I emailed a lot of, a few scholars and they, you know, gave me names of a few other scholars and nobody knew. So eventually it was a Google Books result because I just tried putting the word diaper in to stuff from that, you know, time period and from that part of the world. And I found a mention of diapers. So, okay, I'll, I'll take it. You know, uh, I can, that confirm, uh, since I'm not writing a scholarly book, like that's enough evidence for me to put the babies in diapers in a novel, you know. Um, but yeah, I do ask along the way, but the pe and I I did ask some friends um to read it at the end. Sometimes it's hard to get people to read a whole novel. I'm not sure I succeeded at that. Um, I was more concerned with a sensitivity reader because I I have a Native American character in the book. Well, actually, I didn't at the time I began um having looking for a sensitivity reader, but I wanted you know, talking about whose stories are told, um, this question, actually, I feel like this is a really good way to get kids to think about um, what stories are representing and what they're not, is you can read kids a book, um, and then you can ask them, um, who else might have been, who who else was maybe there, lived there, that, you, mm. that is in the story, or, um, and how might they have experienced these events differently from the characters in the story? 
And then they can maybe find out, they can speculate, well, were there any, um, you know, they might think, well, were there any, uh, I'm Chinese, were there any Chinese people in North Dakota in 1900? And then, you know, there are ways to find that out. Um, but, uh, I mean, kids might not be able to find it out, but they could try. Um, they could they could actually find out, you know, when Chinese people came to the United States and where they where they settled, say. Um, but I feel feel like I was going somewhere else with that. Oh, so so you know, a question I had was, you know, what about what what about the Dakota people who had lived in this area fifty years before my characters arrived? What had happened to them? And so I made sure that they're mentioned in the novel and that they um, that history is mentioned in the novel and. One of my um, Native American sensitivity readers, who was Lakota, said um, she was really helpful because she was so picky. So I was actually really glad I asked her. She came up with everything she could think of, and some of it seemed kind of like, um, you know, maybe maybe um, too much. But she said, "Well, I'm coming up with everything that I could think anyone could possibly object to." And she was a Native American activist, so she really knew. Um, so she wanted to make sure that I didn't use any word like "open" or something like that that might have suggested that the land had been uninhabited. So she sort of commented on a couple passages like that, um, even though the land obviously gives the impression of being, you know, wide open. So I had to use different adjectives sometimes. Um, but she also said, I want to, you know, I feel like it would be good to put in something positive about the Dakota people. So because of her, I am imagined, I, I, and she mentioned beadwork. And I thought, oh, yes, I see how that could connect with the themes in my book. And I have my main character run into a Dakota girl about her age in the town. I mean, you know, town, it's uh, in the little house on the prairie sense of a town. Um, and um, and have her see beadwork on the girl's bag of a crane, which is a motif that, you know, one of the sort of motifs in the novel. So because, you know, I was so grateful that I that uh, she read the book and gave me those suggestions. So those were really helpful to me. Yeah. Well, would you guys like to do an exercise about family history? So. My thought is that I, kids love to do this kind of thing. And I've, I've often had um, kids do this for a workshop um, to interview. I, I often say to kids, um, interview your oldest relative who will talk to you um, or a friend. It doesn't have to be a relative, but interview an old, older friend and bring a, um, some kind of recording a device and ask them really specific questions about their childhood. So the kids go off and do that. And then they come back with the stories and we talk about how to make, uh, you know, begin writing that family story down as a written down story. And I feel like this can be a really good way for kids and older relatives to bond because they hear these stories. I often, one of my favorite questions I say to them for to get people to talk is to say, how did you get in trouble when you were a child? Because often then the, the person will laugh and remember some story of something they did um, and kids will find that interesting and, and um, you know, want to want to write about that. Um, I also say, ask really specific questions. So I, I find that really specific questions get people remembering better. So like, here's some kinds of things you could ask, like, um, do you have any scars? Where do they come from? <laughs> you know, what happened when you got that scar? Um, or do you, um, do you remember having a best friend at any point in your childhood? I usually ask questions about child childhood because I'm interested in children's literature. Um, do you have any memories of relatives who ever annoyed you? Um, what did they do? Um, do you have any memories of relatives that you had fun with? Um, do you have any memories of holidays or a particular holiday? The more specific your question, the, be the better it's likely to be at evoking um, some memory that the person didn't even know they had. Like, how did you learn to swim? Or do you have any memories involving candles? You know, people like candles. Oh, yes, actually, I remember that time I knocked over the candle, you know, or something like that. So I encourage them to ask these really specific questions and then come back with the story. And then we talk about ways of writing the story.
So grownups can do this too. So at this point, I thought that you guys might like to break into little breakout groups for seven or eight minutes. And that's a really short period of time. And just ask each other, like think of a question and ask each other and get us, you know, get your, your partner to give you a story. Um, and then, you know, maybe we can come back after seven or eight minutes and talk about how you might begin writing down a story like that or, or what you can do with kids to have them think about how to begin writing down a story when, once they come back with them. So, you know, you can um, opt out if you like, if you really don't want to. You don't have to share anything that you talk about your partner with. Oh, by the way, brothers and sisters can do this too. So if you're like the oldest person in your family, you're like, well, I can't do this. You can ask a sibling. I feel like kid, people, adults have parallel experiences, but they're not identical. And I don't know everything about everything my siblings experienced by any means. So if you would like to uh, be, I think you're being broken into um, uh, little breakout groups as we speak. Yep. Um. So all set? Yep. Okay. Yeah, Susan, come back to us. Um, with this Amy, is she not there? Yeah, maybe I'll move. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah, I'll move Steffi into a different room. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Great. Okay. And you timed them? Yeah, I see you have yeah. it. Set. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Those were great prompts. Those were really great prompts. Yeah. yeah. I love the specific ones because then you hear a story you never heard, like how your mother learned to swim or, or something like that. It, it can be really fun. Oh, Amy went. So I guess now I need to move. Should I move? Yeah. I thought that could happen. People are like, I don't want to do this. And they might leave. I'll move Bridget back to room four. I don't know what to do. Oh, there. Okay. Okay. And Robin, you know, you can sort of... Um... You know, you can just sort of say, like, send them a message saying, um, I hope everybody's comfortable and starting or something like that. Do you know how to do that? Yeah. But yeah. I mean, everybody went. Okay. All right. I'll we'll figure well, it out. They yeah. will. Yeah. Oh, we have our little plant. Bridget is with uh, Amy. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> Wait, is Janice, is someone with Janice? Yeah. Margie and Janice are together. Oh, God. why am I not seeing that Margie's there? Oh, now I do. Okay, got it. Okay, good, good, good. That is the CJP calling. No, why? It's the CJP. <laughs> I'm sure they're trying to raise money. <laughs> they know I didn't sign up to go. <laughs> they call and they say, how come you're not in, on our bus right now? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I hope the buses are there. Yeah. Hmm. What time does the march begin? I think they were opening the gates to the mall at 10 and then the rallies from one to three. Yeah. And the schedule of the speakers were like from one to two. So that I saw at some point. Um, Susan, where do you live? Right now I live outside Boston. Yeah. Which town? Sherburn. Oh, oh yeah, you're at Hebrew college, right? So you're nearby too. Yeah. Wait, did you say you're from Maryland? I am, yeah. Where? Yeah. Baltimore. Oh, all right. I'm from, did we have this discussion? We might have. I'm from Bethesda. Where are you? Oh, Bethesda. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Did totally you have different a world. feeling as a child, like, this isn't the right kind of weather? We, <laughs> we should be having- No, not oh. at all. No. no, not at all. Like, we had plenty of snow days. And the best thing about the snow days, especially, like, as we got older, is they would call snow- like snow days when there was the forecast of snow right. <laughs> like but we had like a good amount of snow days and like sledding and hot chocolating and shoveling driveways and we did have snow days but we didn't get much actual snow I mean I remember thinking you know going well going back as an adult and thinking 
there's that's not there's not a snowfall that's a dusting well now I go anywhere else I'm like I cannot believe people are complaining about this amount of snow (laughs) like (laughs) having lived in Boston for so many years and but the thing is that they're not prepared you know they don't right that's the thing it's not that there's it's just the unpreparedness and the inability to get rid of it and The other thing that I think is a big, big difference between living down there is the schools are all by county. So Bethesda might not have gotten a whole lot of snow, but the northern part of Montgomery County could have had a lot more snow and they would close the whole county and there might be actually nothing on the ground. That was like, that was also a great thing. Yeah. (laughs) Snow days are nice. Mm -hmm. Um, when I started teaching at Wellesley, they never, ever had snow days. It was one of their principles. We never closed the campus, but now they do sometimes, which is good because in those days I lived right across the street in faculty housing. And now I actually have to drive to get there and shovel a driveway. So uh, I have cleverly learned to schedule my classes later in the morning and not at 830 in the morning, because if you have it at 830, you've got to be out there shoveling. It always doesn't it seem like it tends to snow overnight more than during the day. So yeah. to do all that shoveling for really early in the morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we had these neighbors um, and the hill in their backyard went like down and then it curved. It was sort of like an L, but if you missed the curve, you ended up in this like kind of ditchy creek place with like a lot of trees. I cannot believe that my parents let us go sledding there. And they knew we were doing it. I mean, they came with us often. I walked down there as an adult one day just to see like where I was actually sledding and if my memory matched the this hill. And it more or less did. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe nobody, like we all survived. <laughs> like nobody. Un- yeah, like I would, not a parent, but I would never let my kids sled where we sled. Yeah, I'm much more careful too than my parents were. I feel like, oh, they had a lot of us, <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> No, but it really wasn't. I, my mother was actually very careful for the time, but still we did things that I think, well, yeah, I climbed on that neighbor's garage roof. That was fun. I, I remember liking it up there on the garage roof, but nobody knew we were there because we climbed up the backside of the garage. But, but still. Marion, you grew up in a city, right? Like more city-ish? Well, I grew up in New York, but in Queens. So it was a neighborhood. Yeah. But did you have hills to sled on? Um, not in my neighborhood, but my cousins uh, lived right next to Riverside Park, which has a big, <laughs> one of those, you know, big dips, um, which also like, you know, you go down and there's a, a, a fence at the end and you crash into the fence. So <laughs> yeah, that's where we used to go sledding a lot. Um, yeah, because where we lived, it was very flat. Um, yeah, so we used to like, you know, we would build snowmen and roll around in the snow and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. I remember trying to make snowmen and the snow would pick up the snow from the grass. So like you, it would become bare after you rolled it. And like that, that's not very, that's not how it's supposed to be. Not what it looks like in the books. Right? <laughs> so I think they either have 33 seconds or a minute and 33 I don't know I I never know how where they get the countdown you know there's uh, a way my to... guess is they have another minute because nobody came back yet right that's my guess we'll see we'll see in 15 seconds mm-hmm. there is a way to set it like beforehand to what I did. I left it at a 60 second countdown, but I don't know whether I will going to find out right now. Oh, here it is. Eight minutes. Do you want to close the breakout room? So close them now because then they'll get the 60 seconds. Yeah. Oh, here comes people. Oh, excellent. 
Bridget, we moved you around a little bit at the beginning. I hope, it, I hope you weren't in the yeah, I, know. I was. I noticed that. I was, of course, in the midst of talking. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Where'd those people go? Oh, now here's a new person. <laughs> it was good. It was all good. We needed to even them out. I was like, I'll just move Bridget and hope she's not mid-sentence. <laughs> it was a 50-50 shot. <laughs> Thank I talk you. a lot if you give me a chance. So it's always thank a good. Your, thank you for your flexibility. Or, <laughs> no <yes>. worries. <laughs> I won't know when pe everybody's back. So I don't know what the total count of people. Um, there's two rooms that are still talking. Okay. Room yeah. two, room five. And, yeah, and Sandy. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, there's here's, here's, here's everybody. I left by accident. <laughs> Okay. okay, I think everybody is back. Yep. Okay. Um, so what I would do next with kids, and I would do this on different days. So I would, you know, first send them off to go talk with relatives and get that nice recording. And I tell them, save that recording because you are going to want that recording later. That is going to be precious. Um, save it somehow. Um, but then, you know, kids come back with material. I hope. I hope you got material in your in your groups. And um, are, you know, maybe able to think about starting to write one of these incidents down as a story. Um, and I, I don't know what level of experience you all have with writing, or whether you write or you don't write, I don't know. So I'll just say uh, one thing I find really helpful with kids is to talk about beginning in medias race, that's the, the the term that people who study fiction use, meaning in the middle of actions or in the middle of things, literally. So it can really help to um, think about what would be a good beginning sentence. And then that can really help you to sort of know where to go. So I, I do tend to like this kind of beginning sentence myself. So this would be an example. So the first letter, uh, sorry, the first sentence in a Skyfall song is... At first, they only threw tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't know who's they. You don't know what happened next. But the idea is that you know it's sort of starting in the middle of it's starting in the middle of um uh, an attack on the market. It's a very 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 toned down version of what a pogrom would be like. But the the, the vegetable market is being you know. Uh, set in turmoil by people who are throwing tomatoes and then rocks and then people are leaving the vegetable market hurrying away um so that can be helpful to think about what would be a kind of a good beginning sentence that puts plunges you into the middle of the action or the beginning sentence of black radishes is i remembered this at one point the eiffel tower was ugly um and we're, we're in the main character's head so then the next sentence is, that was the only word for it, Gustav thought, gazing upward. It used to soar a vivid red-brown up into the sky over Paris. Now it's been painted a different color because of the war. So um, the Eiffel Tower was ugly there. So there it's not an action so much as what your character is thinking. Okay. Um, and so in, in a case like this, you've heard a story, uh, you could start with, um, let, let's say it's a story about childhood. You could start with an in, uh, in medias race sentence that begins with somebody saying something. So it could be, you can't play, said Rachel, you're too little. You know, that could be like a way to begin telling your, your story or your partner's story. Or um, you can begin with something happening like, uh, Janine crouched on the floor, spinning the lopsided dreidel, or trying to, let's say, trying to spin because it won't spin, let's say. Um, so, you know, you can begin with something somebody's saying or something somebody's doing, but what, what people tend to do who are very beginning writers, so kids tend to do is feel like they need to begin like setting everything up and you don't have mm -hmm. to, that you can just sort of begin the story where things are happening. So that's what I would recommend um, as the next thing that you have kids do is think of a, um, a first sentence that could get sort of plunge them right into writing the sentence. And uh, if we had more time, I would have you do that now. But um, I, I think I'm not going to do that because we don't have that much time left. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear how things went or, you know, whether you came up, got any good stories um, in your in your groups or um 
you know, it could be your own story, your own memory that came up. So you, I was going to say, take either a story of your own or a story of your partner's and, you know, try writing a first sentence for it. Um, so it could be a memory you had that you would want to write about. Um, anybody want to share anything or you don't have to, but anybody wants to. Kind of more well, talked to, to each other, but go ahead, Sandy. Sandy and Sandy did not follow instructions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We, we just sort of got, we, we were, a, we were a, uh, on a date at a table and we got to know each other. Um, and we slightly began to talk about our last, uh, our recent or one of our manuscripts and how we were doing it. So we didn't follow it. We were in the, we were in the dunce corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, we followed directions and, and Janice asked a question that really, it was about an animal stories from like childhood about animals which started me thinking on things i haven't thought about in years so it was a really great prompt to get us going in so many directions um and so, and just so different than my brain would have thought would have naturally gone if i were like thinking of stories so it was it was a great question janice that's great yeah do you have any idea of what could be a first sentence of one of the the memories that came into your head? Uh, the, the chickens were were like wandering around the front lawn in Newton. Oh, that's um, great! Yeah, that's a great image. That's a great beginning. I love that. Yeah. What? What? I want to know what happened next. <laughs> have they gotten loose? That you know, these are. This is why it's so great to begin in Medias Race, right? Like you're like. How did how were they wandering? Did they get loose? Did some kid li leave the? Is she going to get in trouble because she left the gate open? You know, did she is she going to have to round them up? What tricks is she going to use to round them up? You know, it just it gets your brain engaged, and that's what you want in the beginning of the story. So great, yeah. We were talking about snowstorms, and sort of a lot of memories came. And um, at one point, I said, "I can't believe my parents let us do this." um a sl sledding on a certain type of hill and I don't know I might start a story like that like I can't believe my parents let me do this sort of the mystery and like what were they actually letting us do yeah what were they thinking yeah Susan can I ask a question that I posed in my conversation with with uh, Sandra Feeder sure so I'm saying that in in a in a manuscript that I'm revising to death I'm coming across one thing that bothers me and you brought it up a little bit in discussing that you have sensitivity readers but um this is sort of that I'm so sensitive to this issue that I'm not moving ahead with the story for example I'll just mention what it is so I'm writing a picture book about what life was like for a child for a couple of kids who are the main characters uh in a picture book about moving uh, emigrating to, to Israel from Ethiopia so I don't have sensitivity readers, but I have Ethiopian Israeli friends who are telling me their own experience before they made Aliyah and their parents. So depending on the village that they lived in, they created the Passover matzah in different ways. So oh. there's not really one answer. So I'm th when I when I find one inf piece of information, you know, that's my sensitivity reader. And then I have another person who says it's a different way. So how do you know what the real thing is? And then say I'm I, I'm done I'm, I'm comfortable with what I've written to then find in three years if you're lucky enough to have the book published that you've made a giant goof and it's not true well um first of all I would say there aren't many people who are even going to know right? right so uh, you know I first of all I would say I encourage you to go ahead and do it um but then I think the author's note is a really useful thing exactly. for disarming yeah. criticism so I would put an author's note where I said something like, um, uh, there appears to be a wide variety of ways that people made matzah in um, Ethiopia. Um, this, name the person, person one says this, right. remembers this, person two remembers that, you know, person three remembers that. In my story, I chose to have this happen because blah, 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 you know, and, and then, People can't say you're wrong because that's the person's memory. 
Yeah. Memories are tricky though, because they aren't always correct. It's true, as you were saying. So it's the longer ago, especially if the person was a child and it's a long time ago. And so when I was interviewing um, relatives for black radishes, my, my father had a little sister two years younger and some things she remembered a little bit differently from him, nothing of historical significance. But he also said he um, his family moved from Paris into a, a tiny village where they had been on vacation in the center of France, where they hoped they'd be out of the way of the Nazis right before the invasion, because my grandmother, my grandfather thought things are getting bad. So um, we moved the family to this little village in the center of France. And it was like a tiny, it's a tiny place, this tiny, tiny number of houses, dirt roads. And um, my father remembers seeing Nazi soldiers marching down the road in front of the house where his family had gone to disappear and meld, it, meld with the local population and be away from the Nazis. And they marched right down his street. And he said it was the most terrifying thing he ever saw. And the um, the fascinating thing, the, the really incredibly lucky thing is that the line that the Germans decided only to occupy part of the country and they only occupied the northern part and the coastal part at first. And they drew a line across the country and is practically within sight of the house that they rented in this village. So um, it's right across the river. So they just happened to be on the safer side of the line. But I said as a grown up hearing this story, but but that wasn't the occupied part of France. So what were the Nazis doing marching down your street? And I thought maybe he remembered it wrong. Um, but I did some historical research and I found out that yes, they, you know, they did. Well, of course. And when you think about it more deeply, they they conquered the entire country. Once they had conquered the entire country, they withdrew to the occupied part. So yeah, they marched all the way down to the southern uh, border of, of France um, in, the, in the course of their occupation. Um, as we, the hour ends or has ended, um, thank you so much, Susan, for sharing with us your research, um, some of your own family, um, the story about your book, um, a new idea for me as I hadn't thought about sensitivity readers, um, and appreciate that and appreciate thinking about how to get kids writing and telling stories and love the idea of sort of starting in the middle of the story. Thank you. Um, Marian, I believe just put, or is about to put, oh yeah, she put, um, our next workshop is December 12th, Jewish traditional folk tales with Rabbi Ben Rosen. Um, and you can register at hebrewcollege.edu. And I promise we will send you also an email with the registration information. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks thank you. So everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Today. Have a good rest of the day.